excited. Hello, nerds. Welcome to another episode of the History Nerds United podcast. I'm your head nerd, Brendan. Thank you so much for being here. Today we have a special episode of the podcast. We have Dr. James Kirby Martin to talk about his book, Surviving Dresden. The reason why this is a special episode is because... It is historical fiction. I don't normally read historical fiction, but I made an exception for Jim. He's been fantastic to me since I started History Nerds United, giving us plenty of content, plenty of leads on other authors. And when he said, I wrote my first fiction book, will you talk about it? I said, absolutely. Goes through why he decided to dip into historical fiction, a little bit about how he got there, how he decided to come up with his characters, and how to balance out the history with the fiction. Listen, I am a tough critic when it comes to anything that has to do with fiction, especially in book form, but Jim knows what he's doing. I really like the book, and now let's go talk about it. I'm gonna shut up. Let's talk with Dr. James Kirby Martin. All right, welcome to the podcast, Dr. James Kirby Martin. Jim, thanks for being here. Well, thank you in, uh, in turn, Brendan. It's certainly my pleasure, and uh, looking forward to our conversation. And we're doing it a little backwards, right? Because you and I have already talked a couple times. Uh, you're a scholar on Benedict Arnold, and that's something that we've already recorded and people will hear later. But first up, we're actually here to talk to you about Surviving Dresden, which is your first novel. All right, you d you've done a lot of writing, and this is your first novel. What made you decide, hey, it's time to jump into fiction? Well, there are various factors that uh, came into play, uh, one of which is that in my writing career, I've always been looking for the good story, the story that's worth telling and the story that uh, would add some meaning to whatever the reader was looking for. So that I wasn't just re uh, wasting the reader's time. A lot of academic literature and academic history um, is very detailed. And you, as you read, you start to wonder, why am I reading this? What's the point of all of this? And uh, so one of the things that um, has really fascinated me over the years is really the matter of developing the story. And I can do that writing nonfiction, like my book on Benedict Arnold, or I can do it as I'm beginning, beginning to learn uh, <clears throat> through fictional means. And this is my first real attempt at producing a novel. Uh, and so that's part of it. And if I put it this way, I've read some very good novels over the years. I've read some really rotten novels too at the same time but the good ones all have a basic characteristic and that is that they really do understand the historical background around which their characters are circulating and that was very very important to me uh, in doing surviving dresden and it if i could give you a couple of examples there's an author by the name of kenneth roberts and roberts wrote wonderful novels back in the 30s and the 40s that i read when i was much younger and, and are still very popular today, uh, dealing with the life and early adventures of Benedict Arnold, as a matter of fact, but they're very historically accurate. And, and that is impressive in itself. And getting people really interested in history, you can do it through novels. It just doesn't have to be nonfiction work. And the other part of it is the ability to develop, to develop characters. And Quite often when you're writing history, you just don't have really enough information about whoever it is to really get into the character of that person. That is the soul of the person. But in writing a novel, if you're doing it correctly, that's another goal. And that is to really get to understand where people are coming from and understanding that people come from many different directions and whatever the core issue might be. And so these factors really came together. But then several years ago, back in 2010, I actually spent the night and the next day visiting Dresden. My wife and I were there. We were uh, traveling around Germany. And that's when we ran into a local guide who was determined to tell us that the Allies had absolutely no reason for bombing this city, that it was a terrible mistake. Thousands were killed. It was inexcusable. Everyone knew the war was coming to an end. and. If you thought any differently, you probably, as she was at one time, not a good member of the Communist Party, because that's really what she admitted to us that she had, because Dresden was in East Germany after the end of the war and really didn't get freed up until the late 1980s and early 1990s. So she sort of stimulated me because she's saying 
this was a horrible mistake. It was a tragedy. It was unfair. People were killed mercilessly with, with no rhyme or reason. The war was almost over. What were the Allies trying to accomplish? And so I just put myself on a reading program for the next two or three years where I would select this book or I'd select that book and try to, first of all, learn much more about Dresden, its role in the Second World War, why it became a military target, at least for a brief period, although some think it should have never been a military target, and I'll, I'll readily admit that, and why the Allies in the end, after much hemming and hawing, and ultimately with the agreement of Russian leaders like Joseph Stalin, decided to go ahead and bomb the place into oblivion because that would actually help Stalin in his eastward advance into Germany. So that's how I got started. Really, it was just a person who said, eh, this was this was a terrible thing to do. And really, when you look at it uh, from a military perspective, the war isn't over. It's a long way from being over. People are being killed all over the place. And really, one of the questions then that comes up is, how do you stop the killing when the killing won't stop? So these are the kind of things and in combination with my background in military history that sort of came together uh, in the production of this kind of a story. And now you didn't write this solo. You wrote this with Robert Burris. How, how, how does that come together? And then also, a, a lot of times you'll see two authors' names on a book. Like, how does that work? You, he helps you out with certain things, or you're kind of writing in concert, or you write a little bit, send it to him, and he kind of gives you feedback. How does that all work? Well, in our case, uh, Bob and I hooked up again around that time in 29 and 2010, and we were working on a different project. It was tied into a book that I did on the Oneida Indians and the American Revolution, co-authored with another historian, as a matter of fact. And this book did very well in the marketplace. And I asked a friend of mine who was a sometimes scriptwriter whether he might be interested in telling the Oneida story of that particular Indian nation in, in upstate New York and telling the story in uh, the form of some sort of a television documentary or movie. Well, Bob is a professional scriptwriter. That's what he does. And through a series of fortuitous circumstances, we met, we agreed. He has a very keen understanding of history and uh, historical issues. He doesn't jump to conclusions and he doesn't have an agenda where he's trying to prove this or that or whatever else it might be. So we did write and almost made a movie uh, about the United experience in the American Revolution. Well, the project fell through. We don't want to go into that. But Bob and I kept working together. And one of the things that happened then, uh, two or three years after that, that's saying around 2013, 2014, uh, into 2015, uh, I approached Bob about, well, why don't we do a, a movie script about the bombing of Dresden? And so he and I agreed, we worked out a, we worked out a deal whereby I would feed him the material, the historical material. He would then take what I'm not really doing if I wanted to, but he really is proficient at it, and that is to turn it into script-like language, you know, with, with the scenes broken down and just like you'd find in any kind of a movie situation. And we completed a script on Dresden and the bombing of Dresden. Uh, and most of the characters in the book had some part in that. And we circulated it, got some mild interest as one can get, but couldn't get that firm bite. And then we got together, what should we do? And then we changed the focus. Uh, and that is, we went from a main character uh, that I appears very briefly in, in the book, but uh, we downgraded him and we upgraded the character Gisela Kaufman, um, the half-Jewish woman, and turned her into one of the major focal points of the book, and that is trying to get at the experiences of people, and in this case, a woman who's trapped um, in Dresden, uh, half-Jewish in background, as not been hauled off to the camps yet because uh, her parentage, her father protects her because he is uh, not Jewish and so on and so forth. So we, we began to explore her and make her more of a central. And we also upgraded uh, our English pilot, Wallace Campbell, and really tried to develop him much more fully than was in the original script. And then the good news was we found a producer. That's good. However, we also found COVID at the same time. <laughs> so, Didn't we all? <laughs> so you know, we talk about an instant shutdown, and suddenly we're just with this grip. Uh, the producer, he, he, you know, Hollywood just started to go, well, 
Well, we all did, I suppose, go crazy. And uh, so I suggested to Bob, I said, well, I have this grip. Why don't we do this? Why don't we turn it around and to write a novelized version based on the script? And that's actually what we did in a relatively short period of time because the script really does outline things. It's, it's an outline for what will become, uh, become the book. Uh, and then uh, the way we did it, I would feed Bob material. Bob would do a draft. Bob sends it to me. I redraft the draft and I send it to Bob. And three or four times we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, uh, not always agreeing on uh, everything, uh, but having enough consensus in the end that we produced uh, the, the book manuscript. And then in turn, we were able to find uh, a publisher for it. So that's really the background. We work well together. And we've, we've actually done three movie scripts, the one, one being dressed and the one on the United Indians. We actually did a third one. Uh, George Washington and the Newburgh Conspiracy, when Washington uh, confronts the army in 1783 and says, no, I'm not going to become your dictator. That would destroy the whole of everything that we've been working for and trying to create a free and independent republic. Uh, and we have other projects like that lined up, and uh, those are kind of in the beginning stages, so I don't really want to talk about them too soon. So that's really what it is. It's a collaboration. That's the best way to describe it. And sometimes collaborations work, and this one worked very well. Uh, and I think we produced, and of course, I'm a little biased. I think we produced a very good book that all sorts of uh, features about real issues and real problems or real people who are set in a very, very difficult situation where they don't know what we know and the reader knows. They're going to get bombed. And one of them is a bomber, and the other one is being bombed. And so that helps build the suspense of the story in terms of how things are going to work out in the end with some, I think, important and informative surprises along the way. It does help that each chapter lets you know just how far out from the bombing it is. But th that's an interesting question that I have as I'm reading the book is you have real historical figures in there. This is not completely fiction. Uh, you have Bomber Harris, who depending on who you're talking to, is either a war hero or a war criminal. And uh, even Uncle Adolf makes his appearance for a short and very uncomfortable scene. But when you're writing stuff like that, how, how do you decide where the historical figure comes in and then how they interact with their environment, right? There are certain liberties you had to take to understand what was happening in the room, and you're taking some things and some people that really exist, but then adding some fiction around them. How do you make those decisions where, hey, I'm going to take some liberties over here, but I want to stick to the history over here? Well, the first goal is to make the history as accurate as possible. And to do that, you do have to include Adolf Hitler. You do have to include one of my, I think, most interesting characters because he's everything evil from my point of view, a man by the name of Martin Muchman, who was the Gauleiter, or he was the regional leader of the Nazi party. He was really in charge of the province of Saxony, where Dresden is located. And he was a power-hungry megalomaniac who could care less about people. Uh, and so he, we're, we're dealing with trying to get these kinds of real characters, and then we're, we're weaving our own fictional characters in and among them. But the fictional characters help tell the story and help make it clear what is going on? And that is, this is a long-term, if I can put it this way, death march for the world. When we start at the beginning, we have one killing. And um, that is the so-called suicide of Hitler's half-niece, Jelly Robel. I think, I don't know whether it's Jelly or Jelly, but it's Robel. Uh, and that is, she is related to Hitler and is living with Hitler, beautiful young woman, Hitler dominates her. I mean, she really becomes a metaphor for what's going on in Hitler's life. He has to control everything and he has to control her. And ultimately, she wants to gain her freedom. And ultimately, they struggle. By the official record, she obviously committed suicide. But by the unofficial record, there's lots and lots of evidence that he probably killed her because he tried to control her. And Jim, I'll say this, too. I read that part of it and I thought, oh, man, Jim, Jim's really lost it. Like, this is sick. What do we need? And then I went wait a second. And, you know, I did what I always do, even though a lot of people would yell at me. I jumped on Wikipedia just to double check, and I went, oh, God, I already hated Hitler, but he gets grosser the more you learn about him. Isn't that the truth? I hate to say that. That's the truth. He was one, well, I don't... 
Words can't describe them. Just, yeah. I mean, if you want gross and mean-spirited and evil, an image of the devil to conjure up Adolf Hitler, because in the end, he, he really convinced himself and a lot of millions of people that he was a god. Uh, and that's just beyond belief. But he was the most destructive kind of a god. And that's, that's what I really tried in opening the book by what I would call, honestly, the killing of jelly. It, it really is meant to symbolize what is going to happen as Hitler gains more and more and more control. And as he gains more and more control, the result is more and more people are going are to die to the point where it gets into the millions, tragically, for the world. Uh, so it's really meant to be that kind of a, because we do, we then go from jelly and or suicide, murder, whatever you want it to be. And we really do suggest it was a murder, not a suicide, by the way we present the story. And we then go to what? Auschwitz-Birkenau. I mean, we, we do that on purpose to make that jump. We originally started the script with Auschwitz-Birkenau. But I said, we got we to gotta set a context for this in a certain way in the frame of a novel because what we know about Auschwitz is so awful, it's almost beyond description. And then we would introduce in another news story, we would introduce various uh, of our important characters, uh, most importantly, Winston Churchill, because we're not telling you where he is, but he's actually at Yalta, the Yalta conference being so important to this story. And so there's a reason for this, but in, that, in those news stories, there's a weave of fiction with fact. For instance, in the uh, news story about Churchill, there's a fellow who is being interviewed by the press. I made it all up. <laughs> it was some high level. I used his name. I can't remember it right now. In the British cabinet. And he's sort of hinting around because saying, well, what is, what is Churchill really up to? And that sort of thing. And he's one day I had this little inspiration and Bob thought it was okay. Uh, and so that's the thing when you write a novel. It's accurate what he is saying but we don't have any idea what he may have said or whether he even had that particular interview. But it's also part of the storytelling process to feed the reader more information to help to keep developing the story. And our two main characters, uh, Gisela on the ground and Wallace the pilot in the air, are slowly going to come together, but then don't actually, it's not that kind of a love story. There's a different kind of a love story that's going on uh, involving this Wehrmacht, soldier, Albert, uh, and uh, he has some aff affection for Gisela, and that will play itself out. And I'm not going to give away the ending of what happens there, because I still want people to read the book. But the juxtaposition of the person on the ground, who's the main focus on the ground, and the pilot in the air, who has acquired all sorts of doubts about what he is doing, he's like a conscience. She is trying to survive, and survival is not so much his issue, but the moral dilemma of why do we keep killing people because that doesn't bring an end to the war. And that's something that he tries desperately to work out in the end as we try to put the story together somewhat successfully so. Did you originally plan to kind of have that two-pronged narrative where you have Captain Campbell in the air and you have Gisela on the ground? Or was it about you wanting to make sure that you gave a full overview of what was going on, right? To have somebody on the ground, to have somebody in the air, so you're capturing both points of view? Or was it purely story for you that just kind of grew out of it? No, it really, really was in the uh, first script that I described earlier. Didn't go into detail about it. Uh, our main character was actually an American pilot uh, of Jewish background, and he's blown out of the sky. And he survives and he ends up in Dresden. And we didn't appreciate a couple of things, one of which we may be getting a little bit too close to uh, uh, the Vonnegut novel, which uh, Slaughterhouse Five is what I'm referring to, which is really a weird fantasy story in many ways, where the, the pilgrim ends up in outer space at the end. We were not interested in that. We were interested in realism. Yeah, no spoilers, but nobody ends up in space afterwards. That's right. Okay. <laughs> And then we found out that there was a German production. We did not know this when we started this, a German production that appeared on American TV one time in the History Channel, a miniseries of uh, maybe three episodes uh, about Dresden. And they had conjured up an English character who ended up crashing and being on the ground. So when we were initially trying to vet that script, what happened was we started to run into this. Were you aware of this? And the answer is no, we weren't. Well, your story's a little bit too close. Well, why would anybody want to produce that 
And it's not that close, but it just feels that way, I guess I should say. So we backed off of that. And then after some thought, we decided to go in an entirely different direction with the basic internal story. That's the best way for me to describe it. And so Gisela moves up, becomes more important to the story on the ground. And then those around her, she's not the only character on the ground, but she's in play with a series of characters on the ground, including Albert and Albert's family, the Schmidt family. And uh, we wanted, I wanted the Schmidt family and the father to be, uh, and we never even gave you his first name, just Mr. Schmidt through the whole thing, because he's a grocer and they're running out of food. And he has enough humanity in him that he tries to help his starving Jews, basically. So he becomes like a symbol of the decent German. So characters have different purposes without our saying, this character has this purpose. Uh, and, and, and then uh, uh, we, we do a little bit with uh, Gisela's family. Now, the, the woman we base Gisela on, I, I don't want to reveal that, but uh, there was a particular character that I ran into. I read a lot of memoirs, as a matter of fact, in trying to think about characters. It wasn't just the story itself of the bombing address. I, I try to read about people and their experiences. And so this man, Weinblatt, and I won't talk about what happens to him, but uh, it's not necessarily happy for him. He's based on another character uh, that uh, had a somewhat different life, but was an educated person, uh, was a college teacher, professor, a linguist, and very learned, and was thrown out of the academy for one reason. And that was he was Jewish. Uh, and then he has much of his property taken away from him. Now, with Wallace, I read a memoir. I can't even remember which one it was because I read, I don't know, lots of them. They're out there. <laughs> They're thick and fast that people want to be interested. And some of them are fascinating and very, very interesting with what, what people went through. And there was this one uh, British pilot. I can't even recall whether he was a a bombing pilot or whether, you know, he's flying smaller planes, fighter craft, that sort of thing. But he argued that the war should have ended in 1943 because our leadership, that is, would be Churchill and uh, uh, Stalin. We can throw Stalin in in this situation and Roosevelt, and Roosevelt does put in an appearance too in this book, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, that they should have just sat down and negotiated with him. And that way we ended the war. Now, realistically, that was never going to happen. Yeah, it's a pipe dream. But so, but I mean, I mean, it's a pipe dream on the part of this guy. And he's just trying to rationalize, why was I involved in all of these horrible experiences, which he goes on to describe? And so he becomes a seed for a guy like uh, Captain Wallace. But the Wallace experiences we develop, it is somewhat different in terms of how he's trying to work out the fact that he has been on 20 some missions. He has somehow survived them. He's keeping his crews alive. Things start to go wrong for him. Uh, he's gotten to the point where they we're really not doing anything except killing people, and that's not solving. That's not bringing an end to anything. And so he's thoroughly frustrated almost to the point where he's unwilling to drop the bombs. It is interesting, his arc that you give him where, again, without giving away how it turns up, it, you're inching him towards conscientious objector, right? And oh, what I do like about right. that is... It would be very easy to do the Hollywood thing of, even as I was reading it, I'm like, oh, I think I know where this is going. <laughs> but you didn't. Nope, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. No, nope, Hollywood, that might be a problem, Jim. They're going to try and change that before the movie comes out. Okay, we'll think about it. It's very interesting. He's not someone who you know started out as a conscientious objector, and this is something he's always believed in his whole life. You inch him that way. And it seems to be that's you actually kind of working out yourself what you were talking about that started this whole thing, which is, was it okay to bomb Dresden? Does it make sense from, you know, a humanity perspective, from a military perspective, and things of that nature? And he's, Gisela is kind of that Hollywood, strong female character has got to do what she's got to do. And he's the thinker side of things where it's working out that existential question, so to speak. Absolutely. This, from my point of view, is one of the great advantages of doing fiction because we can take these people any way we want to. And I think in those two instances as major characters, I think we did a good job of developing them. So they weren't. In so many fiction works I've read, you don't get to know the people. It's just, it's amazing to me. I just tried to start a novel. I won't talk with much detail about it. 
And suddenly, 20 pages in, I'm confronted with 15, 20 characters. I don't know who they are. I don't know how they belong to each other. I don't know what it's all about. I don't know anything about them. That's not a comfortable read. Well, what did I do? I stopped reading. That being said, did you, you know, take a few liberties as an author in your writing fiction? You decided to drop anybody in here or there just for fun. I actually already know the answer to this, but I want the public to know, too. Well, yes, and because it was fun. Thinking about the counterweight to a person like Gisela, who's a very hardworking, profound, decent human being, who's being abused because she's Jewish, basically. And that I thought about this then, we should have a counterweight. And this gets to one of the real characters, a man by the name of Martin Moochman. Moochman is the regional Gauleiter word that they would use. That is, he is the strong boss of the Nazi party in the province of Saxony. He's number one, and he's a mean soul. And he likes being Gauleiter. Uh, he's proud of it, and he's kind of an idiot, basically. And by the way, the Russians finally do him all in, but I, that's in the book, too. And that's actually true, what, what explains the Russian. Russians said they had enough of them in 1947 and hanged him. So that's true. The Russians had a, enough of a lot of people a lot. <laughs> you took out a real loser. But <clears throat> I wanted to get a character and find a character sort of counterbalancing Gisela. And I came up with a woman by the name of Inga. Young, beautiful, has no idea what's going on, but is fascinated with Moochman, not because he's attractive, but because he has power. And she's attracted to that power. And then we have this party scene. Now, the party scene, there was something going on that evening, Fauching, this, this holiday is going on in the background. That part of it's true. But whether that particular party took place or whether those people said the particular things they did, I can't tell you. That's part of the novelization of the story. But she sort of latches onto this guy. And it's kind of embarrassing to him because he's sort of flattered that this really attractive woman who doesn't have any idea, she's lost her husband and she's drunk, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so I really wanted to develop her to show there are just people out there. Here we are in the midst of this horrible war. People are dying all over the place. Bombs are on the, on the edge of being dropped. And she doesn't even know what's going on. <laughs> I mean, it's just like... Thank God people like that don't exist anymore. Well, that's right. I mean, leave it, leave it to me to make up that kind of a character, right? Uh, where we know there are tons and tons of people that have no idea what's going around them each and every day. But she is that kind of a person. And I, that's part of the, I suppose, part of the fun of writing fiction, because you can do things like that. Hopefully I didn't offend anyone. That, that's, that's, that's part of the spirit of the story, if I can put it that way. Absolutely. And I think you can't be called a hypocrite on this because you have Gisela, who's the strongest person in the book, period, done. Right. And you're talking about having her mirror image, Inga, right? But for Wallace, Captain Campbell, he has a real life counterpoint that you have in the book, which is Bomber Harris, right? He's somebody who did exist. Right. And you have Wallace who is starting to think about, hey, is this the right thing to do? Are we doing what's right? Whereas Bomber Harris is known historically as being extremely divisive because his idea was bomb the hell out of everyone will ask questions later. Right. And I think that is the perfect balance, right? Gisela needs to have her mirror image as well, especially when Wallace has his. Well, and uh, with Bomber Harris, and actually with a lot of the thinkers and the planners, the notion that we would use the bombing uh, to destroy their... Uh, Wilt to keep fighting, their morale would be the word, I think would be the correct word. That is commonplace, and that runs through the literature. That's very much the case with Bomber Harris. It's like, you bombed us, we're going to bomb you into oblivion. He's a pay-you-back kind of a guy. Uh, he's a very interesting character. He wrote a very interesting memoir after the war called Bomber Offensive, which I have consumed to get a feel for him. What's a little bit different is, in the purpose of the writing, we simplify the whole background to the decision of bombing Dresden because we focus on the orders that do come. Uh, and actually, the Russians were approving them and so on and so forth and thought they were a good idea uh, that come from the Alta Conference. The conference is really devoted to dividing up Europe once the war is over. We know we're going to eventually get there. They can't. The only debate is how long can they last? And part of the decision is we can speed up how long they can last. Even Eisenhower said, if we can convince them by pounding them into the ground, there's no reason to keep going. That is a workable strategy. Now, he didn't necessarily approve the Dresden plan, but that plan 
actually uh, was called Operation Thunderclap, and it goes back into 1944. And interestingly enough, the Americans shelved it. They said, no, we don't want to do this. Then when the, the fill us in historically, and we just didn't want to get into this because it's, it's, we get into the historical details sometimes, you have the Battle of the Bulge, fearsome fighting. And Hitler and the, the battle really are defeated by early 1945, January 1945. Then they begin to talk about using the interior lines kind of a mentality about moving those soldiers, since we've lost here, to throw them up against the Russians because the Russians are now virtually at the, what is it, the Oder River, not all that far, 40 or 50 miles from uh, Berlin at this time. And then if you look at the map, Dresden's about 100 miles south. And the Russians are also coming up through that route, too. And the Germans are moving a lot of troops through the rail system, through Dresden. And there are lots of German soldiers that get killed in the bombing, by the way. And so you go into all of that. But the, the fact of the matter is, it's, it's interesting and fascinating detail for, for the historian or for the person who really wants to understand the war. But all we did was we said, OK, Stalin liked the idea. The Americans and the uh, English liked the idea with the hint, which was another factor. We can show Stalin how strong we are because the, the Russians have an air force, but they don't, they're not loaded with bombers. In fact, I'm not sure of this, but I don't think they had many, if any, bombers. That is the big planes, the Lancasters, the B-17s, that sort of thing. And so it's like, we're going to show the Ruskies we're pretty tough people. And that they're already thinking ahead, even though we're allies, all we do is have a common enemy. But when that common enemy is gone, maybe we can become enemies. Uh, and so we can show them some of our muscle. Uh, and Stalin says, yes, that's good for us. If you break up that rail network, uh, if you take out a city, of manuf because a lot of manufacturing, war manufacturing going into Dresden, that's good for us as we see, sweep both west and as we sweep north and as we sweep, as I, as we sweep west, uh, westward uh, toward Berlin. And so that's all a part of the background. The, the question was, how deep do you want to go into that? And, and can, can you lose sight of the story? And, and our goal is to keep the story moving. And so uh, that's, that's, I think, from my point of view, that was a conscious decision that, from my point of view, as a, as a writer and storyteller, was the right way to do things. But anyway, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an adventure because you're making these decisions all over the place. And I can tell you, honestly, I could take this story and double it, Mike. I mean, it, you kept it trimmed. Uh, this is 180 it, it, pages. You're in, you're out. Yeah, it's not, it's not meant to me. It's get in there, get the story, think about it, the meaning of it. That was, the, that was the goal. But let's say someone would like to come along. And if you're available and you'd like to talk to me, please let me know. I'm talking about the person who'd like to develop a miniseries. We can take all of this and we can expand it. That is, that is, but the, the idea of the book is to tell the story and to get to get on with it and to build the suspense. Because again, if you, you could do, I could do a whole program on the Operation Thunderclap activity that's going on in 44 and into early 45. And we have uh, a face of Wallace Campbell. He's on a bombing run uh, to Berlin. And I mean, they're bombing Berlin to oblivion at this point in time, which is part of the thinking of, of the thunderclap operation. So these things, these elements are there and you can continue to develop the story and the characters if you choose to do that sort of thing. Well, let's just assume, Jim, because obviously we're going to put this out there and this is going to get made, right? In a movie miniseries, I think there's two important questions left. Number one, let's do some dream casting, right? All right, we're gonna okay. we're putting this oh, out there. I'm yeah. about that. <laughs> we're putting this out there. Who's Gisela? Who are we casting for Gisela? I'm gonna go first. Okay. I think it's Scarlett Johansson. I'm thinking of the movie Jojo Rabbit. Oh. She's already played a German. Yeah. And I think she can pull this off. What do you think? I think that's an excellent choice. The actress needs to be young and clearly, uh, as we described, because she is part German. She's also part, I guess, Aryan through her father. Uh, and she's more blonde and blue-eyed. So she doesn't look like she is Jewish. She looks gaunt and wan and everything like that because she hadn't been eating well in clothes and, you know, shot and whatever else it might be. But Johansson would be excellent. And if she's available, I'm sure I'll, I'll be glad to uh, 
talk to her anytime. Isn't that nice? Very of nice of you to, to take the time out of your busy day. <laughs> I'm a kind of a kind guy, right? <laughs> now we'll we'll do one more. Although I want to just add, I'm happily married. Okay, so I'm not looking for a date. We're talking about how talented she is. It's fine. All right, so Wallace. The, the easiest answer would be, okay, we need a British guy. Benedict Cumberbatch is in everything already anyway. So we know how we can do it. Right. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a dark horse candidate that I can come up with. But I, you know what? I could see Christian Bale pulling this one off. I think this is cerebral enough for him that he would love to get into this. Right. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, isn't he English in his background or am I mixing up with someone else? He is. So he has no problem with a little bit of the accent and all that sort of thing. Uh, exactly. And I've seen these uh, various miniseries and there are various characters. Uh, there was a male lead on uh, Downton Abbey and then they killed him off after two or three seasons. I can't remember the actor's name, but he was a very popular guy. I don't know whether you can come up with that for me. The guy that played Poldark. All right. Uh, just to give you another example, dark, handsome, whatever, very, very British, manly. These are the kinds of people that would come to my mind off the top of my head. Dan Stevens. We'll, we'll get Dan Stevens. I think he would love to do this. Okay. Again, if you can find time okay. to schedule to talk to him, I think we can talk him into it. All right. I can probably squeeze, you know, five or 10 minute talk in. All right. I want to close out on probably the most important question I'm going to ask you this episode. Can I be in the movie? I'm not saying I should be Wallace. I think I can do a British accent. I'm not saying any Wallace, but even just, you know, a party goer, drunk guy in the background, give me a couple of lines. Just, I just want to be able to say I got my SAG card is all I'm saying. Well, that would be a possibility, maybe somewhat remote for Wallace. But I have a couple of other parts you might be able to do, such as we have our uh, priest, the, uh, the Anglican priest, who's trying to counsel the Wallace about how much he's torn up by all of this. And uh, then we have um, uh, another character, Colonel Burton, who is in charge of the meetings, that is the briefings. I think Colonel Burton appears at least twice. Uh, and he's a, he's a fictionalized character of the duty officer, we don't question orders kind of, kind of person. Uh, so those parts are still available so far as I know. I don't know if I can do the Anglican priest. My Irish Catholic mother would not be happy with me, even if I am acting... <laughs> okay, well, you know, you can always try out. Beggars being choosers, right? <laughs> and the the I've tried to figure out what my part would be in this. And it may be just walking through a scene or something like that, which I did, you know, with the Benedict Arnold. Jim, obviously you're Bomber Harris. Come on. I've been setting up this big reveal. You are Bomber Harris. I don't have enough of an accent. I'm not sure I could pull that one off. I have a lot of English in my background. It's sort of the dominant uh, from doing the various tests that we do. So I've got that very heavy English background, but somehow as my family's migrated across and developed you know, going back to the revolutionary time, uh, we lost those accents along the way. But that doesn't mean uh, we can't find them. And I, I will admit, even though I live in Texas, I don't have much of a Texas accent, even though I've lived here for what? almost 40 years. So Yeah, I remember doing my ancestry test and it came back and it just said, uh, you're Irish, stupid. There you go. Well, the important thing is, Jim, I'm going to have my people call your people. Okay. We're, we're going to get this figured out. Okay. Um, hopefully we're going to film somewhere really nice that I haven't been before and we're going to get this thing done. But in the time, in the meantime, everyone needs to read Surviving Dresden. We're going to have links for it all over podcast page and everything else. And Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Certainly my pleasure, and I want to encourage people to get into a good story like this because there's a lot of meat there, and there's a lot of entertainment value, and there's a lot to think about at the same time, especially the whole matter of how do you stop the killing when the killing won't stop. It's a fundamental issue of uh, dealing with the morality of war. So we'll leave it at that. Thanks so much. I enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to whatever comes next. And that's it for this episode of the History Nerd United podcast. Thanks, Jim Martin, for coming on and telling us more about his great book. Listen, go on out there. Find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Go on to the website, historynerdunited.com. And we have sponsors now. If you're buying anything on Amazon, do us a favor. Go to historynerdunited.com first. Click on our Amazon banner at the bottom of the first page. Doesn't cost you any money, but for a couple of clicks, we're going to get a kickback from Amazon. Everybody wins. Until next time, nerds. <laughs>